What's up, my babies? Welcome to another informational video. Last time we went over the basics of hypertrophy, but this time we're gonna go over the basics of strength, my personal favorite topic to talk about. We're gonna go over some of the most important mechanisms that underpin strength improvements, and we're gonna provide a framework for understanding the most important variables in a strength training program. So, by the end of this video, you're gonna be an expert in all things strength. The word strength can easily be replaced with force production. And force production can be expressed in many different ways. Running, jumping, throwing, and lifting are all tests of strength in one way or another. To understand why, you might need a quick refresher in Newtonian physics. According to Newton's third law, whenever we move, we impart a force on an external object that can overcome an equivalent internally directed force. Both sprinting and squatting can be reduced down to forces that act on objects. But when we talk about how to develop strength, we really need to be specific. In basic physics, force is mass times acceleration. To generate force, we can either move heavy weights or we can move light weights very fast. In theory, a sprinter can generate the same force as a weightlifter if the reduced mass was proportionally matched by an increase in acceleration. To get a better sense of why we can't get much better at strength or lifting heavy weights without very specific training, we need to better understand how individual muscles work and how we adapt to training. When we squat, bench, and deadlift, we display strength in those specific movements. We're gonna keep this video focused on the science of force, how the body adapts to lifting heavier weights and movements, such as the squat, and what that means in terms of building a strength training program. To understand why strength is most specific to load and movement, we need to understand the basics about how muscles contract. A muscle fiber is a bundle of contractile structures called myofibrils that work together to create a muscle contraction that pulls the two attachment points closer together. It resists elongation or maintains a fixed position against an external load. These are called concentric, eccentric, and isometric contra contractions respectively. Now, each myofibril is made up of a series of structures called sarcomeres. Each sarcomere contains an overlapping protein structure where thin actin filaments are juxtaposed with thick myosin filaments that form the basis of any muscle contraction. When we move, an electrical signal from the motor nerve is translated into a chemical signal that slides the overlapping proteins against each other by creating and breaking temporary bones between the actin and myosin filaments. This process generates the force that reduces the distance between the ends of the muscle against a load. The key takeaway here is that muscles shorten because of chemical reactions in the muscle that are then turned into mechanical forces. The slower the potential movement, the more time a muscle has to form and break more actin myosin bonds or cross bridges in order to produce force. And the faster the movement, the less a muscle has to create the same bonds. This means that force potential in fast contractions is lower even at maximal efforts. This force velocity relationship forms a curve, which is important to understand if you want to develop strength. Light weights can be moved very fast, but because of the way muscle contraction works, the amount of potential force a muscle can produce in a fast contraction is relatively low. Heavy weights cannot be moved nearly as fast, obviously, so the force potential is much higher. And there is an inverse relationship between muscle force and muscle velocity. As force goes up, velocity goes down, and vice versa. That is the force velocity curve. When we lift heavier weights, we learn to produce more force. When we lift lighter weights or sprint, we'll learn to produce more speed. If the goal is to squat more weight, we need to spend more time training with heavier weights than with lighter weights. This is one of several key components of the said principle or specific adaptations to imposed demands. Next, let's talk about strength adaptations. Many different changes follow different kinds of strength training. It's easy to get lost in granular concepts like the pination angle, fiber type shifts, and metabolic changes, among others. 
So we will focus on four mechanisms that are specific to the heavy lifting that supports further strength gains. These are the basic raw ingredients of strength. Are you ready for them? The first one is increased lateral force transmission. A lot of the contractile force of a muscle fiber is not transmitted along the length of a, of a fiber, but laterally to the surrounding collagen. Lateral transmission improves the ability of muscle fibers to work together by disseminating force throughout the muscle. Heavy training increases the number of structures that transmit force laterally called costumiers. Costumier synthesis seems to follow hard training, particularly with heavy centric loading, like a tough squat workout. That's exactly what happens when you grind through that last heavy squat rep of the day. You're essentially generating a signal from new costumiers. This is gonna improve force production in general and lateral sport force specifically, something that's highly specific to heavy weights. All right, next, next let's talk about the activation of prime movers. In order to move heavy weights, muscle activation must be high, if not maximal, in order to generate the required force to move a particular object. Most of the time, we only activate the number of muscle fiber bundles or motor units that are necessary to move a weight. A heavy squat session may involve near maximal muscle activation every single rep of every working set. And other types of training might only maximally recruit the prime movers as fatigue sets in at the very end. There are biological mechanisms that prevent high levels of activation in most circumstances. Over time, strength training removes some of the biological break, breaks, increasing the ceiling of maximal activation. Next, let's talk about load-specific coordination, aka technique. Complex movements like the squat require a lot of coordination. The tricky part is the pieces seem to have to work together differently when different weights are involved. When the weights get really heavy, we have to recruit bigger muscles with better leverage to do more of the work, just like we recruit bigger fibers to generate more of the force. We also seem to recruit more muscles globally, and in particular, more antagonist or opposing muscles in order to help stabilize and assist the prime movers in generating as much force as possible. While technical practice at lightweight is important, it's especially so for beginners that are just learning the movement. It's important to treat heavy training like technique practice as well. Reps build proficiency. Reps at moderate to heavy loads build proficiency at moderate to heavy loads. Load specific coordination is poorly understood, but it might be one of the most important ways that we get stronger from training as it seems to incorporate all of the other mechanisms. Let's talk about the relationship of strength and hypertrophy as it relates to its effect on your tendons. It really wouldn't be a training video without mentioning muscle hypertrophy. When it comes to strength, a bigger muscle has the potential to become a stronger muscle. Muscle fiber hypertrophy is related to strength, but not in a linear way. A bigger muscle can produce more force and it might create a better leverage to produce turning forces or torque at different joints. Hypertrophy may be more productive for some movements than others, but in the squat, big legs provide a lot of support at the bottom of the movement. Stretch, reflex, and elasticity create or unleash some potential energy from the bottom. Big adductors provide much of the active impulse out of the bottom of the squat, and big glutes provide much of the leverage to finish the top half of the movement. Strength training will produce bigger muscles, but not the, to the same extent than focused hypertrophy training will. That's why hypertrophy-focused assistance work often complements strength training very well. Stiffer tendons also follow strength training. Tendon stiffness transfers energy better as less contraction force is lost in the slack provided by an elastic tendon. Think of it as a bow and arrow. The tighter the bow, the harder we can draw against it to load an arrow, and the farther the arrow will launch when we let go. A stiffer tendon improves muscle force potential and overall energy storage and release. This adaptation is particularly important because it's generalizable to other movements and speeds since tendon stiffness is important for all contractions and for injury risk management. Let's talk about training parameters. Given what you now know about the fundamentals of strength, there are some basic principles that you can follow when it comes to organizing your training. What's the first one? The first one is relatively heavy weights lead relatively to more strength gains. We've talked about briefly. Lighter weights can still contribute to strength gains depending on the circumstance, but if your goal is to get strong, lifting heavy weights should be your focus. 
While there are some changes that happen in response to heavy training, but theoretically reduce speed, and there are some, ch some changes in response to speed training that reduce force potential, there are some adaptations that definitely overlap. It's hard to predict who's going to experience an interference effect from combining strength and speed and who will experience a complementary effect. But the current data suggests that we can assure most people will not experience significant interference from combining strength and speed training, especially sub-elite, non-specialized athletes. It's more about how much time you have to train and setting goal-directed training priorities. Secondly, let's talk about the volume sweet spot. Too much volume can reduce the speed of progress and even halt it, but so can too much volume. The key here is manipulating training volume along with intensity to maintain consistent progression and pull back when fatigue begins to limit further progress. Frequency, so the amount of times that you introduce a particular movement into your training block or training week, is of secondary concern. The most important thing that we're concerned with is volume and intensity. Frequency can be manipulated based on practical constraints, personal preference, and what is most likely to produce the highest quality of training across the week, and that's highly individual. Number four, just because specificity is important, it doesn't mean that you can't vary your training at all. Remember, to some extent, hypertrophy does contribute to maximal strength development. Speed and technical work may transfer certain abilities to work at higher percentages. Varying your training is also more engaging and actually a amount of work that can be done before fatigue interferes. This kind of varied workload may also be protective against injuries. Finally, number five, modify your training in order to preserve training quality and ensure support recovery. The above principles are super broad and I know how frustrating that can be, especially if you're a beginner that's looking for a clean, clear cut answer. But the truth is that there is no clear or right way to implement strength training principles. There's many paths that lead to strength. And just like the training itself, acquiring knowledge about how to get strong is a long and cumbersome process that's full of experimentation, practice, and discipline. Like anything else that I preach at Hybrid, I don't wanna teach you what to think, I wanna teach you how to think. So, I don't mean for this to be a plug or anything, but if you're looking for a guide or a plan to get stronger, you don't know exactly where to start, or maybe you're a trainer or a coach that's looking to improve their knowledge about how to program for someone who's interested in getting stronger, then look no further head over to hybridperformancemethod.com, your one-stop shop for all things strength. If you really like this video, maybe hit the like button. If you really, really, really like this video, maybe subscribe to my channel. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and found it helpful, learned something new. If there's any questions that I can help you answer, please drop them down below in the comment section. I will do my best to answer each one of them. And that is all for today, my babies. I, as always, I will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching.